Thank you, and uh, thank you to the organisers for inviting me, Dr. Kaminia Rao. Um, you saw the photo there, I've grown some hair since that photograph. Um, anyway, I'll talk to you about ART and oocyte contributions. So the outline of the talk will be, I'll talk about how human oocytes differ, uh, causes of granularity in oocytes, I'll talk about oocyte maturation, uh, smooth ER and endoplasmic reticulum discs, and I'll show you a couple of videos now that I hope they're working. Um, so, metaphase two oocytes, how do they differ? Um, well, we know that there can be genetic problems, they can be aneuploid, but they can also be euploid, they can carry genetic diseases, but even if they are euploid, the spindle integrity does vary. Um, and you do have cytoplasmic problems as well, these relate to nutrition and they relate to ineffective mitochondria. We have two words that we use when we describe oocytes. We have anomalies, and that describes the cumulus suicide complex, and dysmorphisms, they describe the cytoplasm and the extracytoplasmic problems that we get. So the causes of anomalies and dysmorphisms, well, they can come from in vitro culture, they can come from aging, but they can also come from the lady herself. Extracytoplasmic dysmorphisms include the polar body, the perivitaline space, and problems with the zona. They're most likely phenotypic. And then we have the cytoplasmic ones, which include granularity, SCR discs. They're less likely to be phenotypic and more likely to relate to things like diet and stimulation protocols. Um, two references that I will uh, guide you to are the ESHRA publication of 2012, which was the Atlas of an Expert Meeting. Um, there, the statement, morphological irregularities assessed at the light microscope level may reflect compromised developmental ability and represent a useful tool for selecting competent oocytes prior to fertilization. I'd recommend you read that, it's free of charge on the net. And also, we have the Istanbul consensus that came out in 2011, which again stated that oocyte morphology correlates to development. So if there's one thing that you take away from this talk, please do consider grading your oocytes prior to ICSI and at the time of fertilization check when you're doing IVF as well. It is important because it will help you to select your embryos. We know oocytes differ. Here we have five oocytes. The one in the middle, although not a great picture, is a, is a good metaphase two oocyte. But the top left has granularity, top right a large polar body, bottom left a poor shape, and bo bottom right has two cytoplasms within the oocyte. So we need to select the best oocyte. It will give us the embryo that is more likely to cause a pregnancy. Cumulus suicide complexes, what do normal ones look like? Well, cumulus, from the word cloud, um, they look like clouds essentially. You should see regular cumulus and cytoplasm. You should be able to see the oocyte through the cumulus and you should be able to see a good perivitaline space and a good even spaced zona. And you should also be able to see a single polar body. These are two examples of an immature and overmature cumulus suicide complex. Immature ones, a very few cumulus cells very tightly compacted around the zona and you know that that egg will be germinal vesicle. And the overmature ones, whilst they will be at metaphase two, there's hardly any cumulus there, but the um, compounds within the oocyte that relate to maturity will be deteriorating and that will affect the fertilization potential. What about cytoplasms? Well, you sometimes get eggs without a cytoplasm. I'm sure that the embryologists in the audience will have seen those. And you also get zonas where you have two cytoplasms within them. I have actually done ICSI on eggs that you get like this. I've never transferred them. And you can get 2PN forming in each of the cytoplasms, but again, you'd never transfer them in preference to a normal oocyte because there could be chromosomal problems. Shapes differ. You get irregular shaped ones, you get square shaped ones, you get oval shaped oocytes. And you also get giant oocytes. I'm sure that most of you know that you should put the giant oocytes straight into the clinical waste bin, never fertilize them. They will be aneuploid because they normally carry um, double the amount of chromatin that they should have. And you get problems with the polar bodies. If the polar bodies are large, like they are in these pictures, again, we wouldn't go on to fertilize them. We wouldn't go on to do ICSI. However, there was a study from 2001 that showed that if you have fragmented polar bodies of a normal size, then that is actually okay. That's not related to quality as it once was thought to be. And about a quarter of metaphase two oocytes do have fragmented polar bodies. Zonas, um, we need to consider these. Um, if they are irregular or dark, again, it's indicative of a poor egg. 
and that's going to lead to ART failure. And this was an interesting study I came across from Schmalzer in 2014. He looked at um, the chromosome content of oocytes and related to various dysmorphisms. And he reckoned that if you've got irregular dark zonas, that was actually related to a chromosome problem of chromosome 13. And we know that zona pellucida, the word pellucid, comes from the word clear, so we should always have a clear zona. Um, so other dysmorphisms, well, I'll talk about cytoplasmic granularity and I'll talk about smooth endoplasmic reticulum, especially the discs. So granularity, I'm sure you've all seen eggs like this where you get either central granularity or acentric granularity. Now the problem with this is that it's going to cause uh, differences in calcium oscillations. We had a great talk on calcium oscillations in the previous sessions, but this will affect fertilization and then cleavage and implantation rates. We see this best in animals like the cow, in ungulates, because they have black eggs. The eggs have black lipid droplets, so it's really clear to see pro uh, differences in granularity. Um, but we can see them in humans as well. Granularity changes are normal. Um, when you have a germinal vesicle, um, then you should have granularity towards the center of the egg. Um, however, if you have a metaphase two oocyte, you should never see a halo or granularity towards the middle of the egg. That's indicative of a poor egg, and you should bear that in mind when you're selecting the embryos that form from these oocytes. And of course, you should see a halo when you have 2PN. When you have a fertilized egg, the organelles are concentrating around the pronuclei, so that's a good sign, and it's indicative of a potentially a good embryo. So what causes cytoplasmic granularity? Well, when you have, granularity is a normal feature of oocytes, but we know that ovarian stimulation can lead to changes in granularity. Um, Ten said in 2007 that most oocytes retrieved after ovarian stimulation exhibit variations in ideal morphology, and this is true from oocyte donors. So we know we get a plethora of oocytes due to ovarian stimulation. The organelles cluster, uh, why do they cluster? It could be due to nutritional problems within the female, it could be due to inherent endocrine problems, and it could be due to maturation problems and aneuploidy. So, um, we know BMI affects granularity within the oocyte. This was a study from DiPello in 2011, uh, and his team looked at high BMI ladies and low B or normal BMI ladies, and found that there was increased granularity in the oocytes of the ladies with a high BMI. Um, and this meant that the ladies needed more granulatotrophins, they had lower implantation rate, um, however, the maturity rates were the same. So it was the BMI that was causing the granularity, but it didn't affect maturity, but it did infect overall competence of the oocyte. Another study by Laura Rienzi from Italy, as she looked at over 1,100 oocytes from over 500 ICSI cycles, and she's found that granularity impacted on PN shape. This led to poor um, to day two embryo quality um, and a lower fertilization rate, but that was only in combination with a P, uh, problems with the perivitaline space, vacuoles, or abnormal polar bodies. And there's another comment from Khalili, which was mentioned at MEFS over 10 years ago, which still stands today. Granulation is a single abnormality most observed in failed fertilization IVF oocytes. So we know granularity is linked to oocyte maturation, endoplasmic reticulum in the discs, mitochondria, and calcium signaling. So let's just look at maturation. Maturation is a two-part process. You need nuclear maturation and you need cytoplasmic maturation. Just because you see a polar body in an oocyte does not mean it's at metaphase two. It might mean that the cytoplasm still has to catch up. And that's why we often leave eggs about two hours after egg collection before we do an ICSI to ensure that the compounds like MPF are at the right level. Cytoplasmic maturation is a highly coordinated event, many biochemical cascades. Um, and there are interrelations between meiosis, metabolism, and the distribution of organelles throughout. And the distribution of granularity affects the ability to activate and for cell cleavage thereafter. Uh, taking you back to school, um, we're talking about endoplasmic reticulum. I'm sure you all remember the endoplasmic reticulum. You get two types. You get rough endoplasmic reticulum that has the ribosomes, makes the proteins, and you have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that synthesizes the lipids. It's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that we're interested in when we're talking about oocyte quality. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum is a store, the main store of calcium within the oocyte. It's needed for activation and fertilization, 
as uh, was spoken about by Dr. Roy, Dr. Roy earlier, um, and it's regulated by IP3, inositol triphosphate, and distribution changes throughout oocyte maturation. So, the granularity can be linked to the distribution of IP3 clusters, and the receptivity to IP3 signals, and the efficiency of the signaling. So if you get problems with granularity, it could be linked to smooth endoplasmic reticulum distribution, and that's going to affect the calcium release when the eggs activated. This is also um, linked to the mitochondria. We know the mitochondria produce the energy to make all of the ac uh, activities in the cell progress, and this is coupled to the SCR. So if the mitochondria aren't evenly distributed, then you're going to get problems with allowing energy to uh, continue with meiosis and then go on to mitosis. Um, as, again, continuing from the, the last session, um, we know that calcium is needed at activation and the mitochondria respond to calcium themselves and from signals from the SER. So if the mitochondria distribution is incorrect, A to B uh, provision is suboptimal and the calcium won't be available for the correct uh, continuation of meiosis. You saw this uh, graph earlier. You know that in normal activation, you have oscillations of calcium. They should be of the correct um, depth and speed. And we know that when this is altered, it can have real problems. Whilst you can do artificial activation, it should be noted that artificial activation gives a huge wave of calcium. And there are, are many of us that consider that to be not too physiological. And we do need to look at the health of the offspring uh, before you do consider using artificial activation because it can actually cause um, the cells to distribute themselves into the ICM or the, T8, the trophectoderm slightly differently, and that will have an impact on the embryo development. So what about smooth ER and the ER discs? Well, smooth ER discs, I'm sure that all the embryologists in the audience have seen these. If you have eggs with smooth ER discs, then you have a lower fertilization rate, lower embryo quality, and a lower pregnancy rate. Um, and they're linked, again, to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria. They're also linked to the gonadotrophin dose and the duration um, of the stimulation, which can significantly affect the likelihood of getting them. We know that short protocol stimulation is three times as likely to give you eggs with SER discs as long protocol stimulation. So how common are they? Well, they occur about 10% of cycles. They have SER discs and 19 to 34% of oocytes for affected cycle have SCR discs. And I will refer you to this great review by Chloe Shaw Jackson from a couple of years ago in human reproduction, where she's done a, a really good review on SCR discs. Thomas Ebner from Austria, um, his study showed that only 6% of ICSI cycles had SCR discs. Um, he didn't link it to fertilization rate, but he did link it to lower blastocyst development, more aesthetic obstetric problems if she did get pregnant, uh, lower life birth rates, lower gestational length, and uh, lower singleton birth weight. So there are problems. Problems such that ESHRA in 2011 actually stated um, they recommended not to inseminate oocytes affected with an SCR disc um, since they might be associated with an increased risk of an abnormal outcome. However, 2013, a couple of years later, there was a study that showed that healthy babies could be obtained using your sites with SER discs. So I'll leave it up to you. It's all about informing the patient and it's up to the patient in a way with your advice as to whether or not you would proceed with these sites. So what are the options for ladies with poor quality sites and granular sites? Well, if you have dysmorphic sites, pregnancies can be achieved. Um, we know the success rate is a lot lower. Um, we would encourage our patients to have a healthy diet. If they've got high BMI, then we need to consider asking them to reduce their BMI. And we need to consider perhaps changing the ovarian stimulation if the previous cycle showed a high propensity of SER discs or granularity. And if repeated failure, of course, we always have donor oocytes um, as an option. Should we freeze poor quality oocytes? Um, well, when you freeze an oocyte, this is slow freezing, by the way, so vitrification, the whole picture changes. But with slow freezing, we know that mitochondria and SCR tubules do swell when they're cooled. Um, and we know that when we thaw them, you get increased vascularization. Um, and we know that from slow frozen embryos, calcium waves were always a bit disturbed. However, as I say, this data was from slow frozen embryos. It might be a different picture now that we've got vitrification. 
So uh, uh, some videos from some earth sites that were very granular that we took a few months ago, hopefully. I'll let the chap behind the desk do this. So this is a, a granular Rua site that showed poor developmental capacity. So the division wasn't great, lots of fragmentation. This is generally what we see with granular Ua sites, not good development. However, and again I'll let you do this, Rakesh. This was another granular Ua site from the same cohort. We've got fertilization again after ICSI. And whilst development isn't great, but it's not too bad, fairly good symmetry. But as it goes on, we do get a blastocyl cavity forming. And we get not a bad embryo. We didn't select this embryo for transfer, but it just goes to show that you can get blastocysts from granular oocytes, and of course you can get live births, although it is less common. In actual fact, we didn't freeze that oocyte either. So, in summary for this talk then, poor quality oocytes uh, can be linked to granularity. Um, granularity is linked to clustered and defective organelles, such as smooth endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria. Um, granularity and poor oocytes have poor calcium signaling, poor ATP production, and this can lead to epigenetic changes. It's linked to a higher BMI, and it can also be linked to a female diet and to the type of hormonal stimulation that you give these ladies. Granular oocytes have poor PN morphology generally, poorer embryo quality, and a poorer implantation rate. To, to conclude then, poor quality oocytes, we know they contribute to ART failure, but viable pregnancies are possible, but less likely. We should always include grading of the oocyte pre ICSI and at the time of FERT check if it's conventional IVF. Um, and we should look at the PM patterns, we should look at cleavage and blastocyst patterns. And if you have time lapse assessment, always use that. And of course, the omics, such as metabolomics and genomics. So that's it.